Hey, Kurt, another week, another PBTX show. How was your weekend? Good, good. It's been pretty mellow. I'm just, uh, you know, I, it's this time of year now. I'm a lacrosse dad. And oh. you, know, but I, you know what I know about lacrosse? Nothing. I, like, I am learning on the fly. I just, I mean, obviously all the referees hate my kid. That's standard. But, but aside that, I really... I'm learning on the fly as a as a lacrosse how to be a lacrosse dad. So that, lacrosse that's all is a great fun. great game. I I I really kind of slept on lacrosse. I never really was around it growing up. And then at Notre Dame, they just happened to have one of the best teams in the country. So I, I remember the first time I went to a lacrosse um, game. It was first of all it was beautiful. It was in the spring. Because remember this is like right after this perma cloud of winter, so we hadn't seen the sun in maybe three or four months uh, as a campus. And then. It was a beautiful day. I remember walking by the, the soccer field, which is also the lacrosse stadium. And it was packed, standing room only. People were like picnicking on the lawns. And I was like, what is going on? There are like thousands of people here. And, and I found out it was for a men's lacrosse game. And that was my first entry into like this game. I was like, this is a crazy, crazy cool yeah. fast. It, it feels a lot like basketball. The fast break and the transition, the screen offense. Like the whole thing is very, very basketball. -like. A, a little basketball, a little hockey like in terms of yep. strategy and where you put the ball and, and be able to go behind the net and come back out and stuff. So, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. What have you been up to, Corey? What have you been doing? Decaf coffee. This is big <laughs> for me, Kurt, because I, I have the tea. I don't know. I, I still drink tea. Let's just make okay. that very clear. I'm a big, I'm, a, I'm going into the deep end of tea. Um, but I decided to dip my toe back into the, the kiddie pool of coffee. And, you know, I was thinking, okay, well, espresso is a little too serious. You know, that, that's, that's, that's entering into, you know, master's degree level coffee. Let's kind of go, let's cut it back. I'm not into like pumpkin spice latte yet, but like I wanted to go into like just normal, like black coffee. And I first fell in love with coffee because of a French press in high school. I was, I was that kid who was like listening to Edith Piaf and Louis Armstrong drinking French press coffee, you know, from Starbucks. Like that was me in high school. Uh, so obviously I was very popular. <laughs> and then now I was like, okay, I'm going to do a little bit. It's going to be like, like that, but a little different. So I went pour over and I, and I oh, just went yeah. to this in my neighborhood. They, they roast the beans here in Queens and stuff. And I'm like, okay, great. I'll just try some. And um, it was okay. But then today I got um, the decaf beans and I had, I've always hated decaf coffee. This coffee is out of this world, Kurt. Decaf, like pour over slaps. So that's kind of my big thing now. I'm just like decaf. I'm going to, you and my, I, I will have your, my wife text you. She is the, I mean, she gets up an extra 15 minutes early to do fancy French press coffee and grind the beans every yeah, day. Yeah, that's what I do. I have a little thing and you push yeah. it and it, the beans grind. Yeah, yeah, the whole nine. But I'm telling you, decaf was a game changer for me because I I had never tasted good tasting decaf coffee until I went and did it myself with the beans and the grinder and the pour over stuff. It's phenomenal. So I'm kind of, I think I'm off the caffeinated coffee. I mean, I don't, that's, I'm speaking a little too soon, but I don't know. I, caffeinated coffee kind of to me i mean i like coffee I don't, i'm not obsessive like my wife but if i'm leaning into coffee it's usually for the for the caffeine because i'm like i need this i need this for the three-hour drive or whatever whatever is going on in my life that i now need to be up for so yeah it, it's weird I, I think for me like in in portuguese you know i don't speak portuguese but i took portuguese for like two years in college and uh the way you say drink coffee is uh toma cafe like it's just like tomar is like the the verb form of to take okay. so you, it's like i take coffee almost like you take medicine <laughs> so like to me that's kind of where i'm entering into the coffee realm where it's less about caffeine and i, I think i'm more just like taking it as like a daily nutritional vitamin <laughs> and then also like you listen to the brazilian samba music it's like um it's oh, really yeah. great uh like there's a um it's just like this awesome guy named Car cartola and like i just listen to his music early in the morning when the sun rises because i wake up really early now and I drink decaf coffee. I'm like 80 years old. Anyways, um, <laughs> there, there's a lot. All right. Well, well, when you're out here in LA, we'll go to Denny's Early Bird and we'll, we'll hit it up for you. Oh, wow. Now that sounds sublime. <laughs> uh, so go ahead. Let's, let's, let's think about basketball now. I understand uh, this is a big, big week because seeding, we're getting to the end of the season. And really, Kurt, especially in the Western Conference, anything can happen. I, I understand it's going to be Wednesday night, a big game in the Eastern Conference, but let's just go straight to the West. On Friday, there is a game, Minnesota, L.A., and LeBron, it looked like he was going to sit out. Now he's trying to rush back because even he believes that this team could, you know, go beyond the play-in tournament and get into the, you know, a top seven, top eight seed. What are your thoughts on that matchup? Yeah, yeah. LeBron, first off, he, he talked about making the top six. It's, 
it, mathematically, it's just not, there's not enough time. I think the problem is like, if the, if the Warriors above them go for like 500, then you've got to beat them by two games. So if they go three and three the rest of the way, then you've got to go, you know, five and one. And that's it. just the math is running out on that. But the Lakers in the play-in seem possible. In fact, the play-in in the West is just kind of interesting. First off, LeBron James back, Anthony Davis, it, it, he comes back. They still need Anthony Davis to play in an elite level. You saw the first game LeBron was back and he came off the bench. They still lost because Anthony Davis was good, but not great. It was, you know, 19 points and some boards. And if, if he's not playing in an elite, like everything's got to click for the Lakers. That said, they are a better team now. And I think they, I, I think that, I think they're going to just feel like to you, like they're going to make the playoffs probably through the play in. They're going to be the seven or eight seed. And if you're Denver or Memphis who are kind of locked into one, two, and I don't want to see LeBron in the first round. Yeah, I yeah, that's not a that's not a battle that I would like. That's not a bet that you know I want to try to. You know, I, I, I've seen enough of LeBron James over the past twenty years. But on the other side, Minnesota, what what about this team intrigues you? Because they kind of had a coming out party last year. There was yeah. a moment I was talking to a Minnesota fan, um, and I was like, "You guys are kind of you guys are kind of good now." <laughs> and they, there was like real optimism. They're like, "Yeah, like we're, we we got ourselves a team." Uh, what have you seen this year, this next leap forward? Well, it's been, I mean, it's been such a frustrating year for them because they went in, you know, they made the Rudy Gobert trade. There were pretty high hopes going into the season. They start off 10 and 11 and it just square pegs and round holes and nothing seems to fit and they're not comfortable. Um, and then Carl Anthony Towns, you know, injured, tears his calf, essentially. He finally mm -hmm. kind of owned up to like he tore the muscle there. So, I mean, he missed more than 50 games, but he's come back, Corey, and they've just clicked now too. And I think the big change is D'Angelo Russell is out and Mike Conley is in. And it's just, it's nothing. Like, it's just not that he's a dramatically better player than D'Angelo Russell, but he's a so much better fit as a traditional point guard, as in the sense of like, he's setting other guys up. He is more of a floor general. He doesn't just create for himself. He's kind of a, a guy who really sees the floor. He has a connection with Rudy Gobert. But he's got he's got them kind of flowing. Anthony Edwards looks like a force of nature off the ball. Carl Anthony Towns comes back and he's hitting game winning threes in his first game back. And their defense has been look, Jaden McDaniel suddenly is locking guys down on the perimeter on defense. And suddenly, Corey, this team looks I, I don't know that it's what they expected, but it's closer to what I think we thought they could be, which was uh, a really no good team. Like I thought. Yeah. I mean, going into the season, you and I talked about it, Corey. We thought they were going to be good. We thought they were going to be good. And I think, you know, for me, the caveat there was the youth. But in today's NBA, everyone's young. You know, I understand that. But to me, when you have all your stars that young, it's kind of like, you know, it's um, it's hard to go to the right destination, which is, you know, I want to go far in the playoffs, be a professional, and win a championship. It's just hard to do that if you don't know what that looks like, right? So I think in that instance – you know, I was kind of worried about, yes, a lot of good players, a lot of like excitement. The fans are into it. New ownership. Everything was about like, it looked really positive, but yeah. where's that, that energy being funneled or channeled? And I think you're right about Mike Conley, because the thing about a veteran point guard, you know, and in this league right now is that it can, I mean, it can really change the game for you basically overnight. Right. I mean, someone who comes in, understands the game plan and knows how to distribute the ball to, you know, to your stars versus you look at, you know, other teams in the league where you're like, okay, well, your point guard is also your primary scoring option. You know, that necessarily, especially if they're young, I don't think that works. You know, like Atlanta is a great example of that, right? Like it, it's like, yes, in theory, it's exciting. And yes, in theory, it could be great, but the young players don't always make the right decisions all the time. Right. So that's why it's hard to give them both, you know, the reins and the, the, the gunpowder, if you will. Yeah. Then Anthony Edwards has taken a leap forward and is still just is just fun to watch. Like, but I think this suddenly this team, you know, they're going to get in at a as a they're, they're battling from one of those the six seed with the Warriors. Um, I think they're playoff bound six or seven. They're the kind of suddenly like, man, they, they I don't know if they win in the postseason. I don't know how. I don't know how this comes together in the postseason because I think the potential flaws of Rudy Gobert in Utah still exist, especially next to Carl Anthony Towns. If I get, if they go up now, they beat Sacramento the other night, but if you go up against Sacramento who can put five out so I can mm -hmm. pull guys out, like where does that leave your, 
your defense. And that said, they've looked a lot better lately on both ends of the floor. So suddenly Minnesota, look, it's just, here's where we are with the West, Corey. I feel like it could still be anybody. Right? Like, yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 you want to write the Warriors off? I, I'm kind of writing the Warriors off personally, just because I don't think they're going to flip the switch. But they got Steph Curry, man. They got Clay yeah. Thompson. They got Draymond. You can't, you can't, if you're going to be okay with, you know, not writing off the Lakers, you can't then say, I'm going to write off the Warriors, you know, like if, if, if you have the, Le, well, you have LeBron at any given moment, you know, like he could go off, then you have to say, well, you know, a healthy Clay was playing well. And of course, Steph Curry and his prime, I think I keep forgetting it. I was just talking to someone recently this week. I was like, is the Warriors dynasty over? And, you know, I think it is as it currently looks like this permutation of the dynasty obviously is dying. Um, and there needs to be some shedding to move forward and continue to like have like a, a new rebirth. But like the fact of the matter is they, they got Steph Curry and he's like 34, like he's in his prime, you know, like, so, and, and Clay coming back the way he's playing, the way he's playing, the Splash Bros are still a force to be reckoned with. So I, I don't think you write off the Warriors whatsoever. Um, but what about Denver Phoenix? Because Phoenix is one of those weird, weird teams. Kevin Durant's been out the last 10 games. Uh, they just, they just beat the Jazz last night, but I mean, they gave up a 17 to three run to close the half, and I couldn't believe it. <laughs> like it was DeAndre Aiden, Devin Booker, and Chris Paul out, all out there, and they gave up a 17 to three run to close the half. I was like, this is not uh, the Phoenix Suns team I expected to see. Yeah, well, Phoenix is supposed to tonight, Wednesday night, get Kevin Durant back, and that's the game changer. That is, as you and I have discussed, Corey, there isn't a more malleable, a more plug and play superstar maybe in the history of the nba um but certainly not going right now than kevin durant where you can just plug him into any roster and he doesn't he just fits right he doesn't dominate the ball or change the culture in the sense of a lebron james or luka Doncic or, or pick your superstar whichever whoever you want to go with um Jokic, you've got to play a certain way you know you've got to have the right kind of guys and players around him you can just plug kevin durant in and i think that's that's the hope for the Suns, right? If you're going in that, hey, we've got, I think it's seven games they're going to have with him, six or seven games with him in the lineup. I mean, seven games left. Does he play all of them? Yeah. But is that enough time for them to get it all together? Because if he comes in and just raises the bar that much that fast and you look around the West and suddenly you're like, well, why not the Suns? So I think Denver, I think going against Denver is a really interesting test. Uh, because I still think Denver's, they've been the best team in the regular season. They are going to finish as the one seed. They're kind of the bar, right? That's, if you're going to advance out of the West, the bar is Denver. I just think, I don't know, does it feel this way to you, Corey? Like I've said this, we've said this before in the past. Like, well, the bar is the Golden State Warriors. It's been the Warriors for a while. Or for a while, it might have been the, you know, and we were like, can the Houston Rockets, the Chris Paul Houston Rockets, can they clear that bar? Like how close can teams get? This year, the bar is Denver, and it feels like you don't even really have to do the Fosbury flop to clear this one. Like, you might be able to just kind of spin yourself over this bar. It's, it's yeah, this, this is a weird season, I think, in so many ways for the Western Conference. And, and yeah, it's, I, I, I but with, the, with Phoenix, though, the, the issue with me is um, I've seen this movie, you know, and, and yeah. once again, I don't want to be like too cynical. I love, you know, I, I love trying to see, you know, the, to be optimistic and see the hope in, in, the, in different pictures. But this picture confuses me because I've seen this picture over and over and over again. It's like Kevin Durant, what, you know, dealing with injuries and coming into a star studded roster, you know, with limited time all on the floor. We've seen this and it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Like, the, so it's, it's an interesting, yes, I understand what you're saying. It could be, you know, Phoenix, any given night, any given yeah. series. But the reality is like, I, I just think in the NBA, you need, chemistry you need to have a team you know I, I think you need to have a team and you know it's it's interesting like for instance let's go back way back in the day i'm going to bring you back to you know, like you know to to the old school mark madden since we're in the middle of this right now you had like caitlin clark for instance well that's a bad example because her her team they've had the same starting five for three straight years but like let's say someone oh, by like, the way, you know, she has been the best player at any college game. Oh, no, she's, she's amazing. Like, unbelievable. but anyway she's amazing. 41 point triple double uh, take your team to the final four is just mind mind bending um but the like let's say like you know one of like the great players in college like you know tim duncan like he took wake forest to the elite eight right like you can have like my dad took navy to the elite eight but like you, you, 
even in today's you know college basketball game, like you still like FAU is still in the final four, like you know UConn's in the final four, and Gonzaga with Drew Timmy, who's one of the best college players I've ever seen, you know didn't make it to the final four, you know. So it's kind of like you you still need teams to get to the championship, right? And yeah. I think in the NBA we kind of lost that, and it's like okay, well we can make a good run and we can sell some tickets and go to the Elite Eight and have a Hall of Famer on our team for a year or two years. But we're not going to win a championship. And I think that's opened the door for like a Miami Heat or, you know, like any of these other teams around the corner, like around the edges, like a Phoenix Suns a couple years ago um, to get to the finals. Because it's like, well, why wasn't that the Clippers? Why wasn't that the Warriors? If you just go down the, the list, you know, why wasn't it those teams? And the funny thing is I've got this question in the West that I really don't have for a bunch of teams in the East, which is like, you know, we'll, we'll use the Lakers as I think the obvious easy example. With LeBron James and Anthony Davis and everybody they've got, you know, now around them with Beasley and McDaniels and everything and 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 our friend D'Angelo Russell. If you told me they won any one series, I'd be like, yeah, I could see. Like, did, could they upset Denver in the or Memphis in the first round? Yeah, absolutely. Do they have the grit, the depth, the versatility, but the 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 depth and depth of of commitment and, and physical commitment. Can they do that three series in a row? Like I can give them any one series, but I think it's a, they, Zach Lowe has talked about this recently on ESPN. Like it's hard to win three. Yeah. And I don't know who in the West I look at. Like I can go through the East and go Boston. Yes. Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Yes. Philadelphia. Probably Miami. Yeah. I'm not questioning like Jimmy Butler's grit in the playoffs. Right. Like I don't really have this question to a bunch of teams in the East. In the West, I'm like, yeah, I don't know who's got who's got the mental toughness to do that for three series. I mean, do you have I don't know who I'm going to pick, Corey. I, do you have any idea who you like coming out of the West? Uh, yeah, I, I, it's so it's so tough. It's so tough. You know, I, I think. Hmm. It's a really tough question. Yeah. I want to say I'm going to actually jump on your bandwagon here and go Sacramento, given the chaos and the Western Conference, I think they could peek through. And, I, and I've and i seen, like I said, with Utah, when they were the top seed and they weren't able to go all the way, I think even with Jokic's supreme play, you know, I think he's going to win MVP. You know, even with Jokic's supreme play and the number one seed for much of the year, I still think that Denver falls. You know, I still think that they're ripe for an upset, given the the bottom of the West just being so, yeah. like, I mean, it's, it's like, what's going to happen? It's almost like it's cataclysmic at times. I'm like, I have no idea what's going to happen. You get it. something bad going to happen at any moment for, for the number one seed. So I, I do think Memphis, sorry, not Memphis, excuse me, Sacramento slips through the cracks there. And I think they do have the grit because, you know, like this season, they proved me wrong over and over and over again. I, I think a lot of people wrong over and over and over again. Uh, so I think they're the one team where I could really bet on other than, you know, the tried and true warriors for me. I, I think they're, they're kind of a, always a safe bet with Steph. Yeah. Yeah, there's the same tried and true teams. I'm I might be trying to talk myself into Memphis, who's played a little better lately. They got Jaw back, but I'm I'm talking myself into them, which is yeah. you know where we are, and it really depends on Stephen Adams, who they're going to decide you know next week, kind of as the season really winds down, where he is physically. Um, I don't think they can go too far without what he brings to the table for them. Um, and just yeah. like back to the grit the guy who does all the dirty work. Out east, by the way, there are some good games. <laughs> yeah. so, we've been talking about the West, but like Miami, Miami, is trying North, to fight. Yeah. Miami New York is going to be fascinating Friday because it's it's right because it's the Knicks are trying to secure. They've stumbled a little, especially shockingly. Jalen Brunson goes out; they stumble a little. It's like it's been this way all season. They're trying to hold on. They should be able to hold on to the five seed. Miami's got got to get they they want the sixth seed, obviously they don't want to be in the play and you don't want the risk of the play in. Yeah. Um, plus you'd like to avoid Boston and <laughs> Boston and Mil or Milwaukee in that first series. Um, but they, after, I mean, I was all excited last Friday night. I'm like, all right, I'm good. I'm home. I'm going to watch Miami Brooklyn in a game for the sixth seed. And I expect the heat to show up and be, it was the, maybe the worst game I've seen them play this season. They were awful. Like the Brooklyn blows yeah. them out and mm -hmm. Brooklyn now has the tiebreaker. So Miami can't just tie them. They've got to like climb over them to get into the sixth seed. Um, and if they're going to do that, a win Wednesday night on the second night of a back-to-back, -back, they're in Toronto. 
Like that's a tough one. That's a, that's a big ask, but those are the kind of games the Heat have put themselves in position to need, and we'll see. I'm I the Heat are one of those teams where I mean, I, I'm not writing them off. Yeah, it's it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard to kind of spot them. You know, I, I don't really know this season like you know who who they are, and that's kind of been confusing. I, I, like you, I've seen some games where I watch them and I think, whoa, <laughs> I can't believe. That's the product that this Miami Heat organization has put out on the floor, right? And that's shocking because there are other times when they're, you know, solid, yeah. like, like a solid team, and, you know? So it's, it's very, it's, like I said, I, I don't understand what happened in the past couple of years because I understand last year they made they made that run. But still for me, I just, the, the wild pendulum swings for Miami have been interesting because it's not like it, there's been like a radical change, you know, not like there's radical change in that roster from like the, you know, from like the, the linchpins, you know? It's like Tyler Hero is still getting better, you know, like, Bam and Jimmy and like so, I, I just think I, that's why I'm confused. I'm like you're just kind of adding in new pieces around this, and it's getting more unstable, which yeah. to me is is interesting. You know, from a team building standpoint. I think the other game I'm curious about, and I imagine you are too, is Sunday, Dallas at Atlanta. Two teams uh, battling for their uh, Atlanta's in that mix. Um, Miami probably gets the six or seven seed, but eight, nine, ten out east is a jumble and you would think Atlanta would be the best team of that group, but they haven't been consistent all season. So do they find a way to win this one? And then there's Dallas, Corey, what's going on in Dallas? You're from, you're from Texas. So I'm just going to ask you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah. Look, so for, for Corey's jukebox, I, I wanted to, yeah. to highlight Dallas. Um, and I think this is also indicative of the situation that, the organization organization has put themselves in willingly might i add um but the song is smoke on the water by deep purple you know I, i've been kind of since our van halen thing you know last week i've been kind of going down a rock and roll rabbit hole you're you're in the classic rock now so it's yeah yeah so I, i'm gonna eventually uh, emerge with like you know um like little richard and like chuck berry <laughs> eventually i'm gonna go back to the roots like you know like sister rosetta tharp i'm eventually gonna get back to like gospel rock and roll but right now we're going through you're going through rock. And um, this one is interesting to me because Smoke on the Water, I don't know, have you ever actually like read the lyrics to that song? I do know what that song is about. I, ha I don't, I haven't read the lyrics in a long time, but I do know what the song's about. But yeah, I, 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 I was confused because I, I only know that song because, you know, like the, the classic riff, right? And I'm like, okay, that's a, that's a rock song. It turns out it's about this, you know, it's a classic touring song. You know, musicians, once they tour a lot, you end up writing about your life. And it ends up just being, hey, we're on the road and writing music and playing shows and I'm lonely and I want to go home, but, you know, we're making money and that kind of thing. So that's kind of like what all those songs are about at a certain point when you're on tour, right. which, you know, doesn't get interesting. I guess that's after a while, it kind of loses its luster. This one is about their, guess what, on tour, you know, somewhere in Canada or something. And they're trying to record, you know, um, some songs, but the place that they want to go to is already booked. So then they start going around and apparently like a recording studio catches on fire and there's smoke on the water. And so then they end up like after all, like trying to figure out like what's happening. We go in and try to like save some people or whatever. They end up going to this hotel room that's like bare and spare and cutting some records, you know, and, and like that's kind of what the, the song's about. We'll never forget that time we went to Canada and tried to cut some records and and, you know, I guess recording studio caught on fire, um, which, you know, it doesn't come across that way when you listen to it. <laughs> but that's what it's about. And that's kind of what I feel like is happening in Dallas. It's like you had a plan. The plan was build around Luka Doncic, keep him in Dallas, go to the playoffs, win a championship. You brought in Jason Kidd, right? Like there are all these ideas that are going towards this plan being, you know, um, realized. Then you bring in Kyrie and now there's smoke on the water. I feel like, you know, what are you going to do? It doesn't seem like it kind of seems like you jeopardized the initial plan here. And now, you know, you brought so much attention to yourself that's not basketball related. And you can even see it starting to percolate through like, you know, in these com like these post game comments and stuff. You know, I you can't necessarily say it's caught like, you know, it's directly like cause and effect. Yeah. But like Luca saying there's some stuff happening in my personal life that's affecting, you know, like, you know, my, my, my play. And you can see him getting more texts. He gets suspended, you know, and then you start seeing like. Kyrie's comments about like, hey, like if the guy, the, you know, if the fans want to come out here and play, like be my guest, you know, it's like, so there's kind of like all this stuff happening around that's not basketball related. Like and we've seen this happen like everywhere he's been, you know, so it's yeah. kind of like, to me, it's not necessarily cause and effect, but they, they are correlated. You know, we weren't like, we yeah. weren't talking about this stuff before Kyrie got there. 
So now I think there's smoke on the water. Yeah, I I feel like with Dallas. First off, I love the, the 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 way you told that story, but also like the point that like bands get certain to a certain size and they've all got their travel story. It's kind of like comedians reach a certain level and then suddenly all the, they they got airplane and airport jokes because that's <laughs> that's all they are. <laughs> yeah, they spend they spend all their time there. Yeah, um, Dallas. I don't, the funny thing is, I don't think Kyrie is the problem in a, in the sense of like, we brought him in and things went sideways. They're actually, I, I looked this up the other day for uh, some stuff I'd written, as of a couple of days ago anyway, they were plus 4.6 per 100 when Doncic and Kyrie are on the floor together. It's been working sort of, but they their defense is just so it basically just outscoring teams and they lose games. They lost two in a row to Charlotte. It's a game of that. Charlotte had 22 more rebounds and 20 more points in the paint. Like they just did whatever they wanted inside. They were getting to the rim. They're running lobs because nobody can kind of stop the backdoor cuts and stuff. And so, you know, Dennis Smith jr. Is up there either driving and dunking or throwing in lobs and, and, and enjoying it on his former team, by the way. Um, kind of savoring those moments, but like, I, I'm, I don't know, Corey, does it, I don't know where they go from here. I mean, is, is this working well enough that, I mean, it's up ultimately up to Kyrie. I think Dallas would bring Kyrie back, but yeah, but you want to bring him back point, and try to because, retool around him. No, but I think you make an interesting point. Cause maybe there, there was smoke on the, just to be fair to Kyrie here. I think you're right. I think there was smoke on the water previously, you know, because yeah. I mean, Chris Daff didn't work out either. Jalen left Jalen Brunson left. obviously when you, when you get paid, that's a pretty good incentive. Yeah. But like, you know, like you're right, almost that there, there hasn't been any sort of consistency as a second person to, to Luca. And one has to beg the question of like, why? Because it, it certainly isn't for lack of trying, yeah. you know? So that's a good point. Maybe, maybe there was already smoke on the water. And then now it's just kind of like, in, because of the media attention that Kyrie brings everywhere he goes, that it happens, you know, to almost always be non-basketball related. It seems like maybe uh, there's a little more focused on that element of, you know, storytelling. Whereas, you know, maybe it was always there. That's, that's a good point. I'm also, yeah, and I'm, I'm financially, like I think they kind of have to try to bring Kyrie back because they kind of painted themselves into a corner with, you know, we've seen LeBron's teams do this in the past where we keep making short-term moves to keep our, get guys around our superstar and suddenly you, your roster isn't really flexible or, or what you're looking for and it's really hard to make roster changes where if you look at the really the, the organizations we always think of as well run yeah Miami we can debate what they should do with Jimmy Butler stuff but they've got a bunch of draft picks they can move and flexible contract you know Duncan Robinson and Corey you know um, all these other contracts that they can move that are in the right range uh, you know they've got guys they if they they could trade Tyler Hero if the right big name came up like there's stuff they could do. They left themselves options. And I don't feel that way about Dallas. It's like, it's all Luca. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So let's talk about Kurt, Kurt's corner. So um, yeah. some, some teams um, just yeah. want to say, look, <laughs> White we, we can go Portland, you know, Damian Lillard, we'll go Washington Wizards with Bradley Beal. Uh, just recently, you know, uh, with Ben Simmons and, yeah. And, and I understand in Brooklyn, like he was coming off the bench for a while. I understand like he probably isn't, you wouldn't necessarily consider him to be the star, but he is, you know, you know, a, a big time name on that team who's being shut down. Uh, what exactly uh, is the connection between being shut down at the end of the season to trade speculation, Kirk? Yeah, it just comes up automatically, doesn't it? Like there's a really logical reason for Portland to shut down Lillard. They are not... Um, I don't, as of us talking, they are believed mathematically still alive, but in practice, like they're not alive for the last play in spot, but they have the fifth worst record in the league, like a 10.5% shot at Wemba Yamba and a 20 something percent chance of being in the top two. And let's just make sure that let's get those odds. <laughs> let's, let's and there comes a point where you're like, why are we risking the health of our superstar other than other than he fills the gate and fans are buying tickets to see him, which is a legitimate concern. But with this many games left, I think that their thought is, well, at this point, why are we risking it? And let's try to go get a, a draft pick. And I think the Wizards are kind of in the same boat, like with Kuzma, with, you know, they got to re-sign him this summer, obviously, but 
with Beal, like, hey, let's just see where our draft pick lands at this point. Um, but the second you do that with superstars, well, they're unhappy, right? They're not happy. I mean, if, if we're not there yet, but if Dallas misses the postseason, the Luka speculation will start. That will, will he ask out? Will he be on that? Um, and I don't know that that's fair, but it's, Corey, I fear it's just the transactional, transactional NBA we live in that, and we've been, in Lillard's case and Beal's case in particular, do you feel like people have looked at the careers of LeBron James, who is almost a mercenary in terms of like, well, this is where I can go to do, this is, mercenary is the wrong word. I'm going to go where it's best for me. And if that means leaving Dwayne Wade behind to go back and play with Kyrie and Kevin Love, I'm going to do it. That's not really working out anymore. I'm going to go to Los Angeles and and where there's a nice young core and we can go get somebody like Anthony Davis. Like he's ruthless almost about being willing to go wherever it takes to win. Lillard's kind of a little old school, right? He's like, I'm going to spend my entire career. He has never asked for a trade. He has not demanded a trade. In fact, as recently as a few, I don't know, a month ago, he was like, no, I'm ride or die here. Like he's not looking to leave. And yet, Corey, we're talking about it, and, and we're and we're we're putting caveats on it. There's people who aren't. Yeah, it's. I think my disclaimer here is. Um, I, I think, essentially, you know, you, you have to understand what, what do you want? Do you want to have? Um, so, for instance, with like LeBron James. Oh, I see. Before that, the disclaimer is: I think that we're experiencing an overcorrection. You know, because there was a time where you know with oscar robertson where there was no free agency right no. so then i think the uh, the memory of these things is really deep in athletes bones right it's just kind of deep in the game like you remember when I, you couldn't leave or the people before you couldn't leave so you're going to take full advantage of that and i think it's almost like you, you kind of abuse that power a little bit just because you have it right and then you also see how teams were not loyal to you know to people in the past so you're like okay well if they're not loyal to me I'm not going to be loyal to that. I'm going to do what's best for me. And that's the language that we keep seeing. Like James Harden has said that multiple times, you know, like is it Kevin Durant, like all these guys, it seems like, yeah. oh, we got to do what's best for me. Kyrie Irving, everyone is saying like these kind of the same sentiments, DeMar DeRozan, it's kind of like all the way down. Now, with that said, that then leads me to the second point, which is the NBA is a copycat league. I think most of um, professional sports is because what happens with professional athletes is that when you see someone who has success, and I guess it's like that with most people, you end up wanting to do exactly what they do, right? And um, and there's a certain level of athlete worship within athletics. You know, like these kids grew up idolizing Michael Jordan, so then they want to do exactly what Michael Jordan did. You know, and then like so, it's kind of like a it's like a weird thing when you worship and then you become worshipped, and when you're your your whole life you kind of been like conditioned to worship. So that is even when you're like super successful and you're a first round draft pick or you're making all this money, you still can't help but think, well, that guy has four MVPs or that guy has X championships. Yeah. Like if he's if it's working for him, I got to get a I got to get a chef, too. I got to get a private jet. I got a vacation in L.A. I got to go here on my holidays. I got to take my, you know, whatever. I got to get this shooting coach like everything is still yeah. that level. Um, but I do think that then brings to the last piece with Damian Lillard. He has been able to think freely, I think, in yeah. some instances. Uh, which is very refreshing. Um, and I think it's kind of like, well, what's important to you? Do you want to be a basketball historian and write your name like, you know, on the Mount Rushmore basketball? It's going to be very difficult to do that with his playbook. You know, LeBron, I think, understands history very well. And I think he understands that if I win in my hometown and bring them the first championship that they had in, you know, decades, that's going to make me a legend. If I win in Miami, you know, alongside like these legends, then that's going to be important for me as far as like with Pat Riley and this organization playing alongside Hall of Famers. And if I go to L.A. and get my jersey retired in L.A. next to Magic Johnson and Kareem and all these places, that's going to make me a legend. So I understand he, that's probably how he's thinking about it. And Damian Lillard's not, you know? Yeah, and I don't – I think Lillard's just wired a little differently. He's – look, he's he's got real roots in this community, and it's not easy for him to think about pulling them up and moving on. And I – I, obviously, LeBron had that in Akron, in, in Cleveland, um, but just wanted to treat it differently. I, I don't feel like Lillard will move on. If you told me Beal was having second thoughts, I don't know, maybe. I mean, that's really? also, but he just signed a huge deal. He just signed a huge deal, and they've got uh, 
on paper, I think what should be a better team than, you know, Portland is a better team than Portland, frankly. I mean, you've got Chris Stapps, Porzingis, who for all his flaws can play. Um, Kuzma's taken a step forward this year. Suddenly you can look around that roster and say, hey, maybe we're not knocking on Boston and Milwaukee's door, but this should, this is, it should be a plan team. If they could stay healthy, this should be a playoff team. Um, or they should be better than they are at the very least. So I don't know, maybe Beal looks around and thinks it's time to move on, but he's, he seemed more contemplative of the idea. I don't think that's the word I'm looking for, but, uh, or, or, or I said it wrong, <laughs> but I think he thinks about it. <laughs> contemplative. Yeah. Uh, he, he's thinking know. about it more than Lillard, who I think, I don't want to say we'll never move on from Portland because never say never in this league, but I don't feel like Lillard's going to them this summer and saying, get me out of here. In fact, I know internally in Portland, they're thinking more along the lines of we've got good young players and Shaden Sharp and Anthony Simons. We've got some salary cap salary we can move and we've got a bunch of picks. If Bradley Beal, but if, if star X out there decides that they want to move, we can make a trade that's going to be very enticing hmm. to that team. They want to jump in and bring somebody to play with Lillard, I think, more than they're willing to move on. And the only way, by the way, I don't think we even – did we say this up top? We need to emphasize it if we did. only way Lillard and Beal get moved is they go to management, right? Like <laughs> They have to ask. They are not going to get – they are not going to get the rug pulled out from under them. They, are, they would have to request a trade. Yeah, and I think just understanding, too, the, the final point here, in my mind, at least, is, you know, at what point is your quality of life important, you know? And, and I think that being able to be stable and build those roots, and then just also, like, if you enjoy playing in a city, you enjoy living somewhere, and they're paying you hundreds of millions of dollars, like, it's, yeah. like, you know, I, I, yeah. I, you know, so I, I, think, I think there's, like, this obvious point where it's kind of like, yes, everyone wants to win championships, everyone wants to do this. But then once again, if you use your eyes and you, like, look around and you're thinking, okay, well, what if I miss? And I think that's yeah, a big that's risk because we've seen players miss, like Russell Westbrook. And then your value plummets, then you get bought out of a contract, and then you're trying to figure out, okay, well, before I was making $30, $40, 50000000 million a year, you know, and now I have no idea what my value is and no one else does, you know, or, like, you know, like – Carmelo Anthony found himself in that situation where you end up out of the league, you know, for a while. And then you're trying to figure out like, how do I re-enter back in and try to lobby for that? Like if you miss, you end up losing everything you have and everything you have, if it's good, then just like, you know, the, the other side of the fence, like the grass may be greener, but it's pretty green here in Portland. Like, <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, I, by the way, I think he thinks very much that way. He's, he's said in the past, you know, Hey, I could go to Phoenix, but what if I don't mesh? What, what like what if it doesn't work there? Or if I go to wherever, what if it doesn't work there? Is that better than where I'm at? Yeah. Okay. So let's end up with a, a fun segment. So we always yeah, have our I'm magic. Forward to this one. Yeah. So you know, um, Dan loves to karaoke. Apparently, that came out. Yes. Maybe. Or you know, I guess he doesn't love. Who knows? Apparently, he can karaoke. You know, reportedly, adequately well. I have not seen it, so that's just you know, that's what has come across our desk uh and he asked us well what's our go-to karaoke songs you know so i'll go ahead and lead with this one there was a time when um i feel like with karaoke this is my theory um you got to have a couple songs you got to have you know your your song that is like a crowd pleaser you got to have a sing-along you know then you got to have a song that is like uh like a like a show entertainment, like a, like a James Brown type of song where like, you know, you like go up, it's like, it's not about singing. It's more about like, you know, like putting on a show um, like that kind of like sizzle effect. And then I think you gotta have a, a, like, a, like a, like a closer, you know, like one that you just kind of, okay, last song, I got the one, the ace in the hole, we wrap it up, go pay the check and we're out. <laughs> I think generally speaking, my take, my theory on karaoke is that country music is probably the easiest to sing um, because everyone loves country music. And I think it lends itself very well to that environment of like perhaps singing along, you know, more country songs than you think. So for me, my go to karaoke song is George Strait's How About Them Cowgirls. Um, it's a, just a great song. One, <laughs> George Strait is a legend, too. And three, it's, you know, yeah. it always plays. It just plays. I what like about it, by the way, about knowing what songs to sing because like, there's inevitably somebody who wants to do living on a prayer and isn't ready for the key change and like, just can't hit like, 
that that song gets high, man. You better be yeah. ready. And yeah. there's some, yeah. I, I, and, I, and, there's, and there's elements too, Kurt, where like if you play a song, right, and let's say it goes to a place that you didn't expect, um, like that key change you just key change yeah. you just mentioned, you have to be willing to be able to sit in the karaoke place like just just instrumental you know and i think like there are some there's some music that is just like okay to listen to with like the karaoke instrumentals and there are other music that's like hey, you gotta you gotta like rap over this you can't just let this you know daisy song go you know what i'm saying like you can't just let like living on a curve go like you have to you kind of have to sing so that's why i think country music's fine because you never really it's like okay like it's just nice music to bob to just just in case you forget the lyrics or just in case it's too high there you go. See, I don't do karaoke because I can't sing. And I realize early on that I can't sing. The last time I did it, um, I think I've mentioned before, my best friend from uh, high school and college is a, sang with the Dallas Met, is a now a music professor at a university um, running their musical theater program. Way back, I mean, way back, uh, a few beers in, we went and did Stand By Your Man complete with all the Blues Brothers hand gestures. Just, <laughs> um, it's, it's a great scene in the Blues Brothers movie and it was a song where we knew the words. So we went and up and did Stand By Your Man. And I think that might be the last time I've done karaoke. I don't really do wow. it. And that's probably, that's probably a good thing. <laughs> it's, it's, in my case, it's a really good thing you don't hear me sing. Like it, <laughs> yeah, it, uh, that's always, it's always a fun way to, to end the show is, you know, let's, let's do a little Mad Libs, but that's, that's my, that's my take on karaoke. So if uh, I know there's a lot of stuff happening in this final, especially in the Western Conference, Kurt, so there's a lot of, you know, a lot of things to look at these final uh, last two weeks before we head into playoffs. If anyone out there wants to know all the cutting edge breaking news and, you know, the analysis that comes after that, why don't you head over to NBCSports.com slash NBA, you'll find everything right there. Kurt, looking forward to next week. It's, it's getting fun. I'll talk to you next week, buddy.